Welcome back, everyone. Going to the second half here, Court of Swords, episode 141. Adam, what's going on? Well, uh, Ramus, Ten Pillars, and uh, and Berg, you cross the open area near the entrance to the Ember's Fortress. Uh, you ascend uh, a short but somewhat steep path. And when you reach the top, you see down into this kind of valley, uh, you see the, the aforementioned giant. Uh, she is now sitting. Uh, she's sitting cross-legged, leaned up against the stone, and she's picking some kind of like piece of rock out of the bottom of her foot uh, and just kind of looking at it. And she has one boot on, not this foot, obviously. Uh, and then you see a group of three dwarves kind of huddled over to one side, talking. And then you see Maharib. And uh, Maharib, uh, you see your friends come up over the, the crest of the... Uh, the hill there, uh, and uh, look down where you are. Okay. I'll stand up and just kind of death stare them as they're, like, walking towards us. Mm -hmm. I don't really say anything until you guys get close. I'll see if they say them. Make the first words. Yeah, so that's, you see that. You walk, the group of you come, you come up. Do you say anything? I will. Well, good to see you again, Maharib. See that you have some familiar company and some very, very large, unfamiliar company. The, the giant, like, noticing that you're looking at her but not understanding your words, looks at you and just kind of makes a face, like wrinkles up her face and growls at you. Um, if you need an actress for this giant, it's Kathy Bates. <laughs> <laughs> uh, beautiful. I love it. God, Perfect. Kathy Bates. Scary. Imagine that bad scary. set hot tub scene. <laughs> that hot tub scene from uh, that one movie. <laughs> Man. <laughs> That's, yeah. yeah. Scary shit. Yeah. Um, I think I, I, I look at, uh, I look at you 10 pillars and I kind of glance over at Berg and then my eyes fixate on Ramus. Um, Ramus, how far are you from the, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I start walking towards Ramus, uh, like pretty slow walk. Um, and I just stare right at you. You left me there, Ramus. I think as I get closer, the fire starts to ignite a little bit more and get a little bit bigger behind me. Mm. Wait, what fire? There's like campfire. The doors oh, are set okay. up. <clears throat> Um, I like to make an insight check. Is he telling the truth? Like, what the hell is seems, going on? Yeah, yeah, something's yeah. off with him. Like, so make make that make that insight check, and then uh, JP, you can tell Dan as much as you think Dan would figure out. Oh, that's a good roll on a twenty three. Uh, you kind of see through Stop. the facade. Thumbs up. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I told you the code word. Do not utter it when I cast the spell. <laughs> I think probably everyone sees like the slight smile on Maharib's face when he says this, but I, I try my hardest to like cover it. You left me there to die, but I did not. And I kind of like sit back and fold my arms. <laughs> to be fair, Maharib, Remus and I had discussed it beforehand and we made the plan to leave you all along. It just took us such a long time to get to that point. Uh, sorry, oh, that's had... Berg's face. <laughs> yeah, I was gonna say poor Berg. <laughs> yeah. I think I think my the smile on my face like starts to widen. It is good to see you, friends. It is good to see you, and by all means, meet. Well, you know these three, but the big one. Yeah, and so you you look over and you see Adikur and and Arish Tum and and uh, Aga and the three of them they're sitting there talking and they're they're sitting around the fire. Aga's got like a stick with something on the end of it. He's cooking over the fire and they they look up and Adikur kind of waves bashfully like, "Hey, good to see you again." And the big one, Bushra, please meet my friends. This is Ramus, Ten Pillars of Gold, and Berg. Uh. And she she turns and she looks and she says in in giant, like she's got a bad giantish accent. She's like, Ramu, 
The Peepa. Berg. And she smiles and she points at Berg. Like, that's a name I can pronounce. <laughs> Berg. Berg, Berg, Berg. Mm. I look at, uh, Berg. uh, I look at Audi Cooler. She, she nods and she, oh. she leans out and she pokes you in the chest. Her fingers like the size of your torso. She pokes you and she's like, Berg. I look at Audi Cooler. Does, uh, does she speak dwarvish? She does not. I've been helping them with the conversation. Ah. Well, ten, ten people, I shall be to her. Yeah, I turn. Yeah, I don't. She, I don't change she, anything. Like, she hears. She hears that. So she. Name. She like. She poked. She poked Berg and was like Berg. And then you say your name, and she turns as if hearing it, and she looks at you, and she's like. To people, and she pokes you in the I, chest. I, I you, make a, <laughs> you make a dexterity yeah. save. Okay. <laughs> uh, thirteen. Okay, let me roll to see if she. Oh, if Jesus she I don't know. Christ. I didn't know. I don't know what the DC is. Uh, okay, let's see. Oh, she missed. Okay, you dodge out of the way nimbly, so she's just like, yeah. and she kind of like loses her balance and like tips over and lands on her elbow, and she looks at you. She shakes her head and she turns to Maharib and in Giant, she says, Maharib, friends are slippery. <laughs> yes, they are. Quite formidable. <laughs> she looks at you like, what? Quite what? They're hard to hear. <laughs> <I don't understand. laughs> she, she nods and she says, um, your friends, too small. She points at Ramus and, and Ten Pillars. Too small. For good fight. Berg, good fight? Hmm. He is a good fighter, yes. I look at Berg when I say that. And Berg, it's like the first... You've never... Act, like, every time I've talked to you or spoken to you, it's been in words that you have to kind of, like, piece together in head. This sounds like I'm speaking directly to you and, like, perfect orc. Like, there is, there is no ah. question. There's, like, nothing in between my words and maybe, that you're trying to fill maybe the Maybe it takes... In. Yeah, maybe it takes a minute, but like Berg, you you might not notice it right away because you're used to being able to converse with Maharib. Right. But then you realize, yeah, you're hearing like Orcish in your head when he's when he's speaking, and suddenly, yeah, suddenly his his language. And I I love this moment too because we have this thing where we think that Berg is not very smart. It's just that Berg's first language is a fairly limited language, right? Like Orcish is a, a less uh, advanced language than common is by necessity but all of a sudden subtext that was never available to you before opens up when you speak to Maharib like now yeah he's speaking to you in a way that is like simpler maybe than before but there's context that is developing there that you're all of a sudden like whoa hey like I understand Maharib better or differently at least I just want to hear him, like talk back in orcish like Yes, yeah, salutations. It's a pleasure to see you again. <laughs> like, exactly. Very <laughs> very good. Mm, hello. Yes. <laughs> Berg takes off his glasses. What the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Yo, dude, what's up? Yeah. Yeah, you see, like, uh, like a realization on Berg's face, like, what? Something I would like to make different about you. Sorry. What were you going to say, Zing? I, 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 I want to make a perception check to see it, like the extent of what I noticed differently about Maharib. I mean, I, I'll right out of the gate, uh, I look thin as shit. I look malnourished as a motherfucker. Okay. Yeah. No question about it. Um, and then, yeah, I guess you could make the roll. I don't know if there's really any other changes off the top of my head okay. um 23 yeah i mean i i guess ask questions if you want because i don't sure I don't, um I don't, your de your demeanor much more jovial I look different about definitely joking like, I around say, smiling yeah. like i seem yeah, smiling yeah i don't like think I we've ever jokey. seen that before <laughs> it's weird i seem yeah. uh much more like just so uh, you have Berg, you have the sudden fear that Maharib has been possessed by a perverted old man. 
There's a twinkle in his eye, and I, oh, <laughs> oh no. And you're not carrying you know, a weapon, like right? squinting. No, I have no weapon. He's like okay. squinting at Maharib, like kind of just <laughs> surveying him up and down, seeing I also, how skinny he is. I also don't have my plate armor on. You would probably notice that yeah. right out of the gate. Yeah, I'm just like, what the fuck? <laughs> and Berg just sends like, what happened to you, Maharib? Well, uh, well, just sit down. It's what happened. Is everything okay inside? Bonnie seemed ironic that I'm saying this, but not herself. Much more okay as can be. Hmm. They were worried you and your giant friend were. Something to deal with. Do you want me to get drug? You'll need food. Ma- Ma- Maharib, uh, as Berg is speaking, your your friend. What was? What did you? What did you say? Your name was? Uh, I think. Uh, Bushra. It means, it means good news or omen. Good omen in uh, Arabic. How how is it spelled? Uh, B u s h r a. Okay. Cool. So, uh, Bushra. <laughs> Tries to subtly nudge you, like to get your attention, but ends up just kind of like hitting you hard enough to kind of like push you aside. Yeah, I kind of roll. And she's like looking at you, like, "Hey, hey, trying to get your attention." Yes. What is it? She just points at Berg. So Berg, she points at you, and she says, "Um, "Berg, look good in face, strong arms. I like he talks small. Berg have wife, wives, children." Oh, good God. Is this in common, or do I have to translate this? No, no I mean, she, she only speaks giant, so she's okay, saying that yeah, to you yeah, in giant, but whatever yeah, you yeah. say, whatever I Berg say, and Tim Pillars and Ramus will understand, yeah. Yeah, I, uh, Berg, I've never asked you this before, and I apologize. Do you have a wife or a girlfriend or anything? Bushra is curious. I kind of smile as I say that. Maybe maybe I, like, punch uh, Bushra's, like, leg or whatever as I say that. Yeah, she growls at you. <laughs> Berg is very, very quiet. Yeah, I did that on purpose. I yeah. did that on purpose. He's talking yeah. to himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yep. Mm. You didn't get what I was saying from my face. God, I'm a shitty actor. Uh, <laughs> um, no, Berg says, no wife, girlfriend. Uh, he like looks back like a second thinking. Yeah, He's looks like, like that. Like, I don't know anymore. So it's complicated. Fair enough. Yes. Yeah, I I think she hears me say like it's complicated. She's like, "What does this mean? Complicated? Is woman or no?" Yes, woman for now. I can't hear that, can I? God damn it! No. Well, no, but it's okay. You can you can you can, you can communicate that through Mahari, right? Yeah. So you say I think that. I still mm-hmm. I think I still go. No, Berg is um available. And you hear that. <laughs> yeah. And she she nods and she says, good, good. And kind of like you see her like thinking like, hmm, she's plotting. She's got plots, thinking about things. <laughs> Maybe if I get big, shiny rock. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So for the rest of the conversation, she's lost in thought about like how to seduce Berg, I guess, or... <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so the, we return to the, the conversation uh, at, at hand. Um, and I think at this point, uh, Adi, Adi Kur and Erishtum and, and Aga have come over. And uh, Adi Kur says to you, Maharib, um, please uh, apologize to your friends for what happened. I, I didn't know that the lawkeeper was going to be that way. I'd never met him myself. He was... Strange. Not at all what we expected. I... I'm sorry. And she, she says that directly to Ramus and Bergen Ten Pillars, but she says it in Dwarven, so only people who speak Dwarven understand that. Um, 
which now I think might be everybody. She just doesn't realize that that's the case. Yeah. yeah. So you hear all that where she, she tells Mahari, like, can you please tell them this? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I understand. It's fine. We've been over this. I know it's different. You, um, Mahari, you said we were going somewhere, somewhere safe. We, we must be nearly there. And she looks at your friends. Is something wrong? Why can't we go inside? I'm not sure. We were denied entry. I maybe look at the three of them. Do you know something about this? First, why are you different? Something's not right. <laughs> All right. Well, I... You left. I stayed. Uh, the dwarves needed a punching bag. I was not going to run away, and um, I guess you could say I died. I'm not sure. I was transported into a prison cell. There was another Goliath there who taught me another way. That's why I'm here. What way? Oh. I could try and tell you, Berg, but it's not something that will make sense. I was... I went back a thousand or so years and saw the way things were. I know more than I thought I would. Now I'm different. I've changed. It, I look at life a different way. Different. When uh, when you say yeah, when you say that, uh, Adikur Adikur says, um, "Mahari Bunder went the Apsu, the Great Change." I'd never seen it in someone who was not a dwarf. It's very unexpected, but not impossible. The stone, it remembers. Sometimes there are those among us who can hear it, see backwards, for whom time no longer matters. I believe that's something like what happened to Maharib. He seems to be safe, uh, not harmed, besides the ordeal itself. It's a very astute way of putting it. Uh, I, I did not know that it was a dwarven ritual. I just know what was and what happened and what is now. Yeah, Aristum Aristum shakes shakes his head and says, um, "Among our people, it's it's different. That's just the closest thing to what happened to you that we have. I think for you it was different, but your people and ours are connected. The stone uh, is our home, and so perhaps like, but not the same." Um, back in the court of coins, yeah. we would probably have like, like, um, temples or whatever churches yes. with people like, I mean, I don't want to game it too much, but like monks like this, right? Yeah. Uh, okay. mm, I mean, not exactly, but, uh, right, people but who, okay. I just want to know magic if... is in people whose magic is internal rather than external. Gotcha. Okay. Marib. As you are now, will you remind me of some of the temples in the Court of Coins, great cities? They have some sort of calmness the way they live in the where they adapt to society. You remind me of them. It's a good look on you. Hmm. I hope that's a pleasant memory then. Now you said a thousand years you went back into the past. Is that correct? I don't know if it's a thousand, ten thousand. I went back before. 
what you know is Goliaths. We were Goliaths when we were Goliath. It means something else entirely. But um let me see if I've heard of that real quick. I definitely <laughs> have. I definitely have uh, heard these stories somewhere. <laughs> I, that, Adam, that's on so, you. That's a crit. I don't know how yeah, you want to like, handle that. <laughs> this is the best possible result you can get, but you're you're looking into like pre prehistory, right? Like, right. Um, you know, there there's there's a limit to what it can be known. So the, the the best you get, I think, is that there is a, and I would love, I don't know, maybe you like dated somebody who is into this, but there is a very weird branch. It's functionally like alien archaeology, right? That idea of like aliens built the pyramid, <laughs> like this idea sure. that there was a precursor species that existed here before everything that we know, but it's, it's laughable, right? It's, it's something that people think is a joke or like nobody, nobody <laughs> takes it seriously. Um, but you'd be familiar with like somebody who was, who was like a scholar of that maybe, but yeah, it's right. It's a wackadoo theory. Forgive my ignorance to this, but you won't upset. It me. sounds like you're referring to the first people. Mm. It's a, <laughs> A myth, a fairy story of of the people who came before everybody. Are you saying that you saw that and you were just you're a descendant of them? Is that what I'm hearing? I haven't thought about it uh, academically like you have. I only know what was, what is, and what has uh, transpired. But in a way, yes, I suppose. We maybe all are. You could write a book. I would love to read it. Yeah. But for the time being, have you brought, in your travels, have you brought anything back, um, useful information or uncovered the secrets of stars or <laughs> what have you? It's a big question, Ten Pillars. I, I don't know. <laughs> if you're asking if I found the person we sought out, no. <laughs> the dwarves... Mm, I had to fight my way out. I did not leave the enemies of the dwarves, but we are not welcomed back. Why we, are these dwarves with you? They were also excommunicated from that place it was our doing we owe them as much to shelter them well you have some bad news we know that you know the direction location of the entrance to the old so to speak but uh, we are oath sworn against letting you go there or your friends. Did you? I figured it. It's been some days. Did you not have a conversation about leaving? Are they not aware that an army marches soon? Maybe now even? They are aware, but days of we were kind of we were of, kind of busy hacking kind of busy hacking ten pillars arm off it took the whole day yesterday yeah i was getting to that like the days have been full <laughs> with immediate dangers we haven't had an opportunity it is first thing on the list but well and i kind of rolled down my sleeve a little bit do you remember the, the the moments before we left, did you have a chance to see what happened to my arm? I did not. I was more fixated on if I've, I was going to live, but what happened? It looks well, new, smooth, like a, a baby's. Like a baby. Yeah. Or she knew even. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, 
in the time that we were fighting or or whatever, having the conflict with the axe or what lies within it, I was in a dream world of my own creating, it would seem, but different. I stared eye to eye with the great green worm, Maharib. And I wouldn't say I defeated it, but I circumvented it. I was able to bring something back from that dream world while you fought the axe. And what I brought back is the knowledge to forge weapons of the metal that the axe was created of, the void metal. I don't know how to do it personally, but the knowledge is in there. I know that. That was my gift. But in exchange, I had to give them my arm. My arm was cursed. It looked like wasp paper and bugs and insects lived within it. And you'll be happy to know the person who was responsible for amputating that arm was Doug. The person responsible for growing it back, of course, is standing right beside me. His name is Krill. Hmm. Have you told anyone I, else this knowledge? Not yet. I don't think you should. When tell you anyone. when you mention it, when you're like the person who did this was Ramus Ramus Krill, um, Adikur and Erishtum share a look where Adikur is like it's it's a look of recognition of like, well, of course, of course Ramus could grow a limb. He Ramus Krill brings the dead back to life. Right? So they kind of look at each other and nod, like, see, you see his power? Are they both in earshot? Like I, they, they Yeah, yeah, everyone's standing like, around in the that. same they're all yeah, okay. everyone's standing around in the same place. I was just trying to figure out if they were like still by the fire, or if they came up, or if yeah, it's a very small fire, little area. Up. Yeah, especially with a, a giant woman jammed in so there. We should watch what we say. That's all I needed to know. Yes, yeah. They uh, Erish tomb speaks common, uh, even if Adikor doesn't. So there's enough. There's enough dwarves that yeah, they can understand you. I speak in celestial. No one can understand me. I don't think that's true. <laughs> you sound cool though. You can speak celestial, Tim. I I took four years of celestial high school. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah, I went to celestial so, community college. Well, it was just, so it's celestial. Right. I haven't used it in forever, but <laughs> celestial is also the language of the high court. It's like um, Latin to the church, so yeah. there would be right, certain yeah. very special like religious reasons you you speak celestial. But yeah, and for some reason, whenever you speak it, it there's just reverb in your voice. It's really weird. <laughs> So you said uh, you were not enemies with the dwarves, but you were not uh, welcomed back. You had to fight your way out, and they still let you live. Mm. Or they did... did... Explain to me how that works. Mm. It was a long debate, conversation. I was put to some rite of passage and fought her funny enough we became great friends after the fight yeah so she she looks and she she nods at you and then in giant even though no one can understand her but maharib she says i was going to win i let maharib win she says she was going to win it's probably true <laughs> but uh these that, were right the, there. What? That, more than anything you said so far, has <laughs> cemented your change in my in my mind. The old Maharib. I don't know that he would ever have admitted that. that well, he was allowed to win. As you say, I have not put any thought to it. I'm still the same person you I was. Still fight good, yes. Not too nice. Y yes, I, but I can still fight. <laughs> good. I thought so. 
but you know, different. You, mm. yes. strange. Good though. I think, yes, good. Remus, I know you. You came for safety, but unfortunately, this place is not safe anymore. Did Vonnie you know, say that these uh, Maharib's companions were not allowed, or or all of them, including Maharib? Can we bring him back? She informed Maharib me. Maharib is I'm definitely welcome, allowed back, but yeah. the dwarves are not, for a reason I'm sure you're aware of, which seemed foolish to me, but I understand. I guess. Did you learn anything else about the dwarves and what they're doing against the armies of <laughs> grave dirt? Unfortunately, no. I don't okay. think they care. I had final words with them, told them to burrow deep or move on from this place. They were in anger and probably did not care what I had to say. I tried, but they were not happy with losing <clears throat> one of their laws it was because of what happened yes not I, good Berg like um addresses the body core in them like yeah i am sorry for what happened assuming you know not um intended she um she nods and she says um Maharib has explained to us. I wish that it could have been different. I, um, I'm sorry too. First thing we need to do was talk to the embers and find out what they plan to do. If they plan to stay in their adopted home, Attempt to fend off the armies of the Necromancer King and Grave Dirt on their own, or they intend to move, or if we can convince them to move. I think, with what I know of dwarves and what I know of Vani and her clan. It's going to be difficult, if, if, if at all possible. When you say that, Erish Tomb pipes up and says, um, these people, what problem have they with dwarves? Mm, it, what people? The embers? The people, that you, the people you speak of, these, these embers. Why does it matter that we're dwarves? It doesn't. Well, what need we to do to prove ourselves? Mm. I don't understand. They, they are racist. <laughs> That's one she, way of putting yeah, it. I, er, <clears throat> yeah, Erishim scowls uh, and says, that doesn't make any sense. They're outcast. We are outcast. We share an enemy in the dead. Why, why do they deny us entry to this place? Especially if it's safe, as you say. They we, we have nothing to give them for offerings, but I, I, I promise we mean no harm. You remember when we were being escorted by you into your stronghold and how you were afraid of the reaction they might have to Maharib. It's the same reaction that they'll have to dwarves. Does that make more sense? Old blood, unhealed wounds. But our our people, and this is still Irish room, our, our people have a problem with Maharib's because of an ancient grudge. We don't even know who these people are. How have we wronged them? In what way? You can see Erishim getting a little bit angry about it. Like, yeah, I, this doesn't make any goddamn sense. I put my hand over you, and just say, <laughs> for the very same reason that you're upset, they dislike you. It does not make sense. There's no need to get angry about this. It just is. We will talk with you. It's not anger. It's fear. Pride. Both stupidity. Old wounds. Same reason why 
it'll be difficult for them to take the same sides against a common threat. They have to be there have to be bodies, there have to be deaths, there has to be burning and decimation before anyone will believe that this threat is real. Adikor says to you, Ten Pillars, um, in Dwarven, so, you know, we can understand it now. So she says it to you, she says, um, but that's how it used to be. And she looks at Ramus and she says, it doesn't have to be that way anymore. We don't need blood and murder and war. We don't need to hide away in, in caverns in the mountains. Harmony is coming and it will protect us. And she looks at Ramus like, isn't that right? Like, I, yeah, you can I, do something I, about this, can't you? I stare very intently at how Ramus answers this. You definitely like to see that I'm waiting for you to respond. Harmony is more than one man. It's that fire in your belly right now. You want to defend this world from what will do it harm while everyone else sits idle. It's something bigger than me. Yes, harmony is coming but it will be a hard-fought battle. We have to tear down the pride of your people and theirs if we're going to save them. <clears throat> and she, um, Adikur shakes her head, and she says, not our people, not anymore. We are outcasts now. You are still and dwarves. And she, when she says that, and we never saw this happen, and, and maybe Mahari, you didn't, you didn't see it, but yeah. um, she, she like touches the back of her hand and she, you notice she has a bandage uh, around the back of her hand and so does Aga and so does Erish Tomb. All in the back of their right hand, they have this like bandage wrapped around it. She touches her idly when she says, not our people anymore. You are still And then dwarves. she turns to Ramus. She, yeah, she turns to Ramus and she says, you'll speak to them, won't you? Tell them that we mean them no harm, that we're, we're not even really dwarves anymore. They have nothing to fear. We have no power. It's like us trying to convince the dwarves of the coming threat. They don't hear what's right in front of them. The people here are the same. They're prideful. They're set in the old ways. It's going to take some major convincing to get them to budge. I think we shall still talk. I would hope so. This is dumb. <laughs> they don't listen. And we leave, Ramus. I'm tired of this. Let me tend to your wounds. The least I can do. Is this to the dwarves? Uh, anyone that's injured can come to me and I will... Yeah. Uh, my look. HP's bugged right now. We just haven't swapped over, <clears throat> so I'm I'm yeah. fine. I just look malnourished, yeah. so maybe you say everybody that. just looks Here, rough. But we'll, yeah, like, we'll just do this I in mean, character. Can... Like I, you say yeah. that it's, we're fine, Ramus. And then maybe look at me as I say that, and I'm just I look really bad, <laughs> like a poster child <laughs> for a late night infomercial. <laughs> well, you're gonna rough. eat, Mister. I, I don't need food, Ramus. I'm fine. I want to make a quick medicine check on his body to see, like, if he looks malnourished. Yeah, sure. Okay, with the 20, yeah, uh, like, he seems, he does seem like he's lost a lot of, like, muscle mass, and there's some some signs of, of bodily trauma, but uh, he looks like he's in pretty decent shape. The Dwarves could use some like attention for their their like bandaged injuries, but yeah, Maharib looks pretty haggard. But if you clean him up, he's actually doing pretty good. Something's different. I like some of it, but I don't like you physically right now. You worry. I feel like much. I got a I got a, I got that text message from somebody I was dating once. <laughs> Everything's fine. I just don't like you physically right now. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> <laughs> come here and I just for the dwarves to come here in yeah, harmony over. we find peace and I start casting 
uh, prayer of healing on them. So they all heal mm, for nine. Okay. Yeah. So sparkles in the air and everybody, they all feel the, the prayer of healing. Um, and uh, yeah, Adi Kor tries to kind of follow along. Like as you're, as you're praying, she's like muttering uh, like a little bit, like a half step behind you. Like someone who can't quite remember the words to a song they're trying to sing. And, uh, and when you finish, uh, she, she takes the bandage off of her hand and looks and there's a rune on the back of her hand, a dwarven rune that's been burned in. But now the scar is just healed. It's not a red kind of like awful mark. It's just miscolored skin in a, a raised area. Do so I recognize this brand that? on the back of her skin. Yeah, everyone who speaks dwarven does. It's a dwarven outcast rune. Uh, it contains a bunch of it's a detailed rune that contains basic information about like what clan they used to belong to, why they were exiled uh, and the terms of their exile. Like you never to return return in a hundred years. Like there's, there's, it's a complicated, like legal brand, which is part of Dwarven, like justice, basically the way their justice does, system works. Does it look similar to what I saw from uh, Hashim or no? Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh. So uh, okay. Hashim had a, had a brand as well, um, but his was different. Yeah. Um, you okay. could make a, an arcana check based on your memory of it. Uh, if All you right. wanted to, that's flat D 20. I'll try 11. Okay, yeah, um, his was much more complicated and uh, probably involved multiple, like, branding <laughs> sessions to, to enact. Uh, theirs seems to be informational. His seemed like the basis of an enchantment. Right. Like right. how you would etch a rune into an item to make it magical. His body was was burned to, uh, to curse him, basically, with dwarven justice. Okay. Uh, theirs is just so that if a dwarven, another dwarven clan, if they tried to sneak into another hold... It could be like, let's see that hand and be like, ah, uh-uh, no, no, no. You are exiled from old dwarvendom, not just your own clan hold. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Ray- Ramus or can not, remove the case that if you so desire, but. No, then- no. These scars remind us of our sacrifices. Point to the one on my face. They make us strong. Yeah. They remind us. Uh, so there's there's a thing that's happening right now and maybe you're only really seeing it because of Adikur and Erish tomb but when Ramus says things like that right when Ramus says like our scars we bear them to remind us of of our experiences that's going in their brain as like religious doctrine right, right. there you that, can see them being indoctrinated yeah. by everything he's saying without skipping a beat I think I'll respond and say, if you require physical and material Reminders that it means nothing. It's just a reminder. You should know that within yourself and not be looking for the material response. Kind of like a challenge to Ramus. <laughs> like if we're gonna get into the the religious doctrine. Well, you need rest. You're talking out of your ass. Mm. I learned from the master, and I think I just bow. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. And you hear, you hear, like, Ramus, you, hear, uh, Ramus, you take 46 pillars. fire damage. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you hear 10 pillars, like, in the, he's like mid smoke of his pipe, and you hear him. <laughs> 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 yep. Awesome. Uh, okay, so you want to do you want to go back into the into the hold, uh, Maharib, you and and uh, Ramus and Burning Templars? I will like I think that conversation comes up, and uh, I'll stay outside with these four if you don't mind. I don't know if do I need to go inside. I, you let me know if my presence will help. Then I suppose I shall go. But she might need to hear it from your lips. Hear what exactly? I can help. That they've been outcast and they're no longer welcome with their people. Fair enough. Is there something you can do to protect them while we're inside? I can stay with them if you'd like. She doesn't like me anyways. <laughs> Very well. I'm, um, is that okay with you? I look towards uh, Lushra. We're going to go inside. Ramus, this one, will stay here. He is a good friend. 
Does she stay? Or is nope. she okay with yeah. that? She she looks at you and and so you want her to stay. You want her to stay here and hang out with the dwarves, and you're gonna go inside. Or you want yeah. her to come with you? Uh, to stay you outside with Ramus. Okay. Yeah. Basically, I'm saying like I'm leaving. Ramus is gonna stay here to yeah. protect you guys. So she 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 just looks around. and She says, "Berg stays." I don't know. Berg. She wants you to stay. Do you? <laughs> and if you look at her, she just grins at you. Unfortunately, no, I must go with you. Talk. Unfortunately, we require Berg within. He is, and there's like a smile. He is very good with his tongue. Some call it a silver tongue. <laughs> and she she looks at you, Berg. Like I don't. You just don't. You don't want to imagine the things that are going through her head when she looks at you. <laughs> uh, and then, and then she nods. And she says, I have all time in the world. She will wait for you, Berg. Let us go inside. Good. Um. <laughs> let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, I'm, let's, we're going to just, okay. <laughs> all right. So you, uh, you all leave and uh, you come back to the entrance uh, some ways away and uh, knock at the door. The guards within open it. Uh, and as you, as you walk back in, you hear some of the guards that were like poised, ready, just in case there was going to be a fight. Uh, you hear the guards whispering like, Myrib's back. He's still alive. And they're like talking amongst themselves. And uh, yeah, Vani is there with the, the lieutenant or the captain or whoever. She's got her arms folded over her chest and she sees you come back come back and she nods to you maharib um <laughs> right <laughs> yeah i nod back um can we speak privately please she looks around um of course yes okay she turns to the lieutenant she she sa- and she says this as a question to you as much as like a statement to her she says um we're out of danger for now. And then leaves a little space for you to be like, actually, we're not. But so do you, what do you, what do you say? Or do you just nod? I just nod. We'll have that conversation soon. Yeah. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, so she says, but be ready just in case. We'll follow Thank you. Thank you, Captain. Uh, yeah. So she, she turns and, and she, uh, she walks with you to, um, uh, I guess probably to like a, a side room. And, um, yeah, you come inside and, uh, there's like, it's just one of these empty dwarven rooms. Uh, it's one of the closest ones. And she closes the door and, uh, she says, um, well, Bonnie, you need to get your people out of this mountain. I'm not going to waste time. We don't have it. It's, you're not wrong. I know I'm not. It's just more difficult than that. We have to wait. There are still embers out in the world who are going to come back to this place. And if they find us gone, what choice do we have? We have to wait for them. We can't leave a message behind. Our enemies could find it and then just follow us. And after that, what's the point? We can stay behind if you take the main part of the tribe with you. So you want me to take the embers and go? And you'll stay here alone? Something like that, yes. She kind of squints at you and like cocks her head and she says, Did you did you become more eloquent since the last time we spoke? Because I don't remember you being this verbose. I, we don't have time for that. <laughs> I don't even know how to respond to that, Vani. <laughs> she she puts her hands up like one 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 thing at a time. I I I think you're right. I think there are dangers here that we need to be away from. It'll take some time. I need to convince Bahath this is the right path. I can do that. We need to gather our things. It's going to be hard leaving this place, especially for somewhere unknown. This valley that you spoke of, tell me, and I need you to be honest, whose idea was it that we go there? I 
think I, I, it immediately pops into my mind, Ramus. I don't say that out loud. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> and I, it was, um, it was Berg's, actually. Did you say why? Fond memories, I'm not sure. I've never seen the place, only heard the stories. It makes sense. The forest burned, left behind. No one's there. She she nods and she says, um, I have memories of the place. Not my own, of course, but Novum's. Some of Agni's as well. We've seen the place before. My... She pauses for a second as if thinking about the word and she says, the Fire Lord has shown me visions of his retribution there. I think it could be a suitable place. <sighs> so, what of you and your friends then? If I do uh, convince Bahath and Awut, Bahath and I take the embers and we leave, you wait here for those missing to return and... You weren't here for this, but Pita is captured in the hands of Grave Dirt. I, I don't know if we can just leave him. Hmm. You... She could be torturing him right now. I, I've seen her magic. It's. I wouldn't want someone that I care about in her hands. So what do we do about Pita? Well, if I may speak up. <clears throat> and this is the harsh truth. I mean no disrespect when I say it, but this is something you're going to have to get used to and become accustomed to. People will be captured. People will be tortured. People will die. And worse than death. You're she, the leader now. She shakes and she shakes her head when you when you say that and she says do not think we haven't suffered. She kind of glances sidelong at Ramus and then back at you and then looks you kind of up and down. I know you come from up north, but things are different there. But here, generations of persecution at the hands of the courts, massacres, villages burned, killings. The Court of Swords is the most fervent of heaven's allies. That's why the Mara struck here. But before they had the Mara to fight, who do you think they were killing? Who do you think they were fighting with? This southern wind you're looking for? Ask him about the blood on his hands. We know suffering. This is not new. Then picture me not speaking on behalf of the court. Picture me speaking... As someone who has seen war and seen battle. How many do you plan to send to rescue one? Knowing that there's almost a guarantee that several of them will die on the way. Either getting the person back or... Fleeing with them in tow. That is what I'm saying. So, so she she says this to Maharib uh, in response, but sort of in in reaction to what uh, what you said. Um, she turns her head slightly towards Maharib and says, "So what do you propose? Did we let Kita die? Did we just leave him there in the hands of that necromancer? Is that it?" I understand. And she turns back to you. The threats and pillars. And you're right. We. Cannot do this alone. Perhaps what I'm asking is for your help. Save this man, this boy. I can't abide the idea we're going to leave him behind. Do you have anything to bargain? Anything to offer in exchange for this boy? 
I think I kind of. The only way you might avoid bloodshed. I think I interrupt and just say, there's three dwarves outside that need refuge, Ten Pillars. I can't think of anything better but to give them that. Perhaps they travel with them. Put this, whatever it is, behind you. Teach it to your people that it doesn't matter what they look like, what size they are, what gods they worship. That we all are in this as one. To do that, you have to act that. You misunderstand my reasoning, Maharib. We, we don't deny entrance to the dwarves out of hatred or, or fear. Not of the sort you mean. Uh, the anxiety about these dwarves is the same as the thief who is caught with his hand in another's pocket. We know this place doesn't belong to us. If the dwarves find out we're here, which means if we're going to abandon it, then they're welcome in our ranks. I have nothing against dwarves as a people. Just, it's guilt and shame, too. Mm. They just learned of this. You should hold no guilt on yourself. And it's good to hear you're not against the joining of those three and the rest of the embers. Yeah, but she shakes her head and she says, they're rare, but there are those among the dwarves who worship Imix as we do, mostly through Agni. She has a, a form that is pleasing to them, uh, a way. But exiles or no, they're welcome am amongst us, but <sighs> she shakes her head like this whole situation is just so frustrating. And she says, um, still, Kita, I, I can't countenance leaving him there. Do you know where Where's he is? Me? There can only be one place. The monastery. That's where they all are now. Uh, Vani, I'll be very honest. I do not know how we get in there and get out alive. It would have to... It would almost be a suicide mission. We'd have to go in there, grab the boy... And use the very same magic that Ramus used to get them back here. That's all I can think of. It's when you say Ramus, she like narrows her eyes slightly. Do I notice that? <clears throat> like, yeah, I... it's just little. It's only for a second. So she she kind of narrows her eyes slightly and says, um, "No, I can't ask that of you." Go there and endanger yourselves in that way. I suppose it's the only way of it. I just... These are the burdens of leadership. I can't make these decisions and then worry about them. Kita is a sacrifice. It must be made. The rest of us will go. This valley, it's north. A long ways of here, but if we travel by the mountain, we should be safe. We'll be going north and trading one enemy for another, but at least the court is an enemy we know how to outsmart. In these mountains, we have the advantage. Bonnie, the fact you still care about this one person's life means that you are a good leader. You're meant for this. Don't forget that. One thing. <clears throat> and I reach into my um, my pocket inside of my robes, and I pull out. Um, let's see. I'm not sure what would what would be the best thing because I have a couple of things that would okay, like official documents that say I'm from the Court of Coins. I have a court seal of office, I have road passes, and I have a government mm -hmm. ID. What okay. do you think would be the most beneficial to give them to let them know? Like, I could write something as well. Perhaps I could seal it somehow to let them, to let, if they run into people from the Court of Swords, to let them know that, that they are on our side. Or that they have... 
passage made a deal with us or something like that. I'm yeah, trying to find I'm trying to find a real world analogy. Um, so they belong to a group of people that have been traditionally oppressed by the Court of Swords. Uh, and so likely any documentation you gave them legitimate or otherwise would be taken away and assumed to be false to give them an excuse to continue oppressing these people. Right. So like, right, yeah. You know, they're they're a bunch of they're a bunch of like I can't find a way to do this without describing your organization as like the SS. But basically, like that's how it is, right? They're they're trying to escape an area that is no longer safe for them. And if they run into other members of the SS having a badge that's like, see, this other scary secret police guy said we're cool isn't gonna help them. They're gonna be like, that's fake. <laughs> get get into the jail. So yeah, I think it won't, I think it won't help. Like unless you were there specifically to like speak for them, it would be assumed it's a forgery, even if it were real. Right. But on the other hand, uh, <clears throat> you know, for a fact that there is just no, they've been downgraded as a priority, right? Everybody here is busy fighting the war against the, the undead. And so they'll probably be able to, as long as they stay off of like main roads and stuff, they'll probably be able to slip across the border uh, unnoticed. Okay. Okay. Well, never. Then I don't speak up if I know that information. Yeah, I mean, I that, instead happen. of speaking up, that whole thought process goes through your head, and you're like, you understand the situation, why it's so dangerous for them. Yeah. Then yeah, the last thing was you know me praising her for being a good leader for caring about <clears throat> the yeah, the soul. Of that's one. right. Uh, Is there? Just out of curiosity, mm. is there a particular importance that this this boy captive holds for you, or is it just a member? I mean, not just, but is it because they are a member of your tribe? She says, uh, there are so few of us, every ember might start a bonfire. I understand. I have to go and speak with the dragon. Before you do that, I have a a question and possibly a request. What is it? I have knowledge. Something that may turn the tide or may be of great benefit. And Pillars, I, I, I do not to. wish you to share this information right now. I apologize. She says to you, what? What is it? We need every advantage we can get. I may need to speak to Agni. Is there a way you could arrange that? She makes a face. A slightly frustrated face. Uh, it's different. Something about it is different than than her normal looking frustrated face. Like she makes an odd facial expression and she says, maybe I, I. This kind of thing takes a lot out of me and, and time. So first things first. If you I have will. something you need to speak to Agni about, it's going to have to wait until after I'm done dealing with Bahath. That's fine. She turns back to you, Maharib, and she says, despite everything, I'm glad that you're back. You seem well. Let's keep it that way. I will try. And she turns to you, Ten Pillars, and she says, you and I will speak again tonight after all of this. And then she, and she leaves. When she's like pretty good at ways out of the room, I mm -hmm. apologize for interrupting you, Ten Pillars. You lost your arm because of that information. I don't know if you should be sharing it so freely. Those weapons are not meant for this world, even if it helps us. What do you know? I know that you lost your arm because of it. I was stuck in some covenant that almost cost myself my life. Ramus was saved by it. It's too much. My arm was the price for the information. That should tell you how important it is, then. 
to not use it? You can do what you want with the information. I will not stop you fully, but I just question if it's worth bringing something like that back into this world. What do you know about it? I know you can give me reason. If you can give me cause to not, but it seems like it is a gift. (laughs) 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 The axe was made by that same substance. I don't know what will happen if weapons start to be forged. Imagine an army that does not control itself, but rather serves the arm of something else. Not its leader, but whoever controls that army through the weapon itself. Is that not something to fear for? Are you saying the metal itself has the mind of its own and not the thing that was inhabiting your particular item? I don't begin to understand it, Ten Pillars, but I do know that whatever spoke to me spoke because of that axe. It was enough to bring itself into this world. Now, if we bring countless more... That's more conduits for it to channel itself through. And you see, like, in a, in a rare moment of, of dropping his composure, like, you see Ten Pillars turn around and just fucking, like, kick at whatever, like, is there to kick at. Frustrated as kick, yeah, kick a yeah. piece of furniture. Yeah. Ten Pillars, why are you upset? They give us this tool, or I, I've, re- I've received this, this method that we might be able to use to fight. Then you tell me that's exactly what they want us to do, that we can't use this thing, this, this weapon I'm we have s- against the armies. Ten pillars. I'm, I'm not, not mad at you, use it. Maharib. I'm mad at the situation. I don't know... It's, it's, I'm sorry. I I understand you're trying to find place and value in all of this. I'm not saying that we cannot use it. I'm saying that it is not meant for the masses. Berg is without a weapon. You have the shards. We collected them. Before we, before you left, do you not? Yes. Also, this armor that I wear, what is it made of? Do, would I know that? You have, uh, yeah, so here's a question. It's, uh, you're wearing the dwarven, the dwarven armor, adamantine, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, adamantite. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I imagine that everybody kind of knows, like, you'd know the word to recognize it. It's a, it's, it's mithril basically, but that's like a Tolkien thing. So we don't call it that, but it's an incredibly, yeah, incredibly hard substance. Very difficult to make things out of. Um, yeah. So yeah. You, you know, it's adamantine. The reason I was thinking it was made of, of like from the void that I got it from, we got it from here. No, you had void armor before and Maharib's armor was also, but it wasn't made of the same. So. Yeah, so there's there's metal that is in the void that is used to make armor and weapons, and then there's this void metal, which is a different thing. That's the greenish yeah, stuff. My wires that's were getting soul iron. There. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. And then so what exactly? What exactly did they say I could forge? Like, or what information do I have about the metal? The the information in your head is a method for. Uh, turning the raw ore of the void, the the like mm-hmm. weird greenish rock that they've been digging up, uh, turning it into practical things. Right, uh, there is a, a way of expertise because the dwarves the dwarves were just experimenting. They'd had a few successes, but for you, it's a right. it's a repeatable way to uh, to turn this metal into objects you can use. Right, and just to satisfy fucking chat, <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Sure. It's pissing me off. <laughs> um did I just do, do I know that this is a way to use the metal to make weapons and it won't it's safe 
yeah. lead back to the Mara. Yeah. Was that That's part of know, the... Yeah. Can, you imagine, can you imagine any situation, and this isn't just for Zeke, this is for chat as well, but can you imagine any situation ever that I would ever put the characters in a position where they have a completely safe option with a very dangerous object? Fuck no. Fuck no, it's not safe. Thank it's repeatable. You, Adam. It's <laughs> dependable, but it's not safe. Yeah. No. God Thank no. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's okay. the that's the deal. Like you you can make a neutron bomb, but it doesn't mean that the uranium you have to use is suddenly not radioactive. Right. Um, so yeah. What what were you saying, Berg, about you pointed to your armor or something like that? We can disregard that because yeah. I got my wires crossed. Oh, okay. um, so you mentioned about you. We can continue though. You mentioned about how I needed a new weapon. Yeah, I, I just said uh, Berg needs a new weapon. You have the knowledge to craft one of these. This is true. Still strong without hammer, but I need something. I can think of no better person to wield something like that that could fight back. What I was fighting. If there is anything to even fight back, a test is, if you will, ten pillars. Test to see Willing if it's to worth. Try. But then that information that you lost your arm for will prove worthwhile. Maybe Agni could forge if you talk to her. As long I will as, come as well. She has known me long. As long as Vani does not <clears throat> know what transpires in that conversation. I'm not saying I don't trust her. I just fear what would happen if this knowledge Ten Pillars has fell into the wrong hands. Mm. She speaks to Please. a dragon. Who knows? Agreed. It is for Agni to decide. This is above Vani. What are your thoughts on that, Ten Pillars? Time. That is my concern. The time that we take to test this out is too much. We won't have time to. We probably don't have enough now. <clears throat> so I say this knowledge is useless. Time we would take to forge weapons for ourselves and see what would happen if we could control it or if it opened up a door to the Mara to come and take over our bodies. Perhaps we sit on the knowledge, then. We'll be around another forge one day. Not well, I day. still need a weapon. That must happen soon. It's true. Did you not collect that spear from the fight? It was a, <coughs> a spear. A spear in the dragon's yeah. side. Yeah, you no, don't I, have I it on you, know obviously, because you don't I know it as a player. I know it as a player. It, but yeah. yeah, you yeah. have it in your room. Oh, from Loom, you mean? Why not use that? Mm. Until we can find a Spear. safe place to craft this weapon. Spear, not a good example. Berg, you can throw boulders. I don't know if you need to put so much faith in a weapon. It's just different. I really, I really but like that Maharib is, Maharib is like that person who just decided to start being a vegan and now is like, <laughs> hey, Berg, maybe you rely too much No, I'm cheese. not saying that. I'm mm -hmm. just saying you can throw boulders, man. I'm not trying to say you don't need a weapon, Berg. I'm saying you can throw fucking boulders. <laughs> It, it just looks like it, right? Because you're just like, well, listen, man, I learned that you can kill with the spirit, not with the weapon. Maybe you should try it, Berg. You don't need the hammer. It was always inside of you, Berg. Okay. Realign your chi and your chakra and push it out at your enemies. 
God, I hate that accent. The voice. You, <laughs> you love, love yoga it mahari. Roof. Yoga mahari. It's so good. <laughs> oh, boy. Yep. Mahari just really wants everyone to get into CrossFit. All right. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, Berg, you do have, you do have that spear. Uh, it is definitely like more like a throwing harpoon than a, a, like you get one good shot out of it before you have to go and rip it out of somebody. It's barbed, right? Which is why it was still stuck to loom. Um, yeah. but yeah, a weapon of some kind would be useful for sure. I guess. Yeah. He's just going to use that. What is the actual uh, stats on it? So I can add it to my sheet. So I, I don't have. Uh, I will, uh, I'll figure that out for you for now. It's just a spear. Okay. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll it's just like a one shot details. thing that I have if I need to. Um, it's a it's like a throwing go, spear. Yeah, stab. Yeah, you you could try. It's not really made for that. You'd have like I think you'd have disadvantage if you're fighting with it as a melee weapon. It's just too lumb like cumbersome. Boulders, it is. Uh, then you, yeah, well, you I mean you can't fight with boulders as a melee weapon either because. Man, just yeah, fucking carry, can. carry some balls yeah. around. They, <laughs> they have they have basically any mundane weapon that you want around here. Like you'd be able to find pretty easily. Um, yeah, I'm probably just going to look for but, some sort of weapon. Yeah, just something. Yeah, yeah that's fine. Um, okay. Uh, so, Ramus, while Berg and Ten Pillars and Mahri and Vani were having this secret meeting, uh, what have you been getting up to? Um, I'm. I guess I've been asking them, like, how did they get out of there? Like, what what transpired, and like, what was the journey from there to here? Like, because I was trying to get filled in on the story basically from them. Yeah. Did you, did you come back to the, um, did you come back to the fortress or are you still, or do you stay to talk to the dwarves? Cause they, uh, they stayed in, back, right? The dwarves and the giant. Yeah. I'm still with the dwarves. Um, my oh, okay, told me to cool. watch them. Watch, yeah. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Okay. So we cut, we cut back to that and yeah. So they're basically just, they're telling you you're getting, you're at the end of a retelling of what happened in, in 140, uh, 140 B uh and uh yeah and adi adi kur is uh is like um so it seems to me very much like apsu a, a state of mind we call the stone mind where uh after imbibing the sacred liquors you were able to commune with the, the very earth uh there are some our, our ancestors who believe that the earth was a uh, an entity a living thing a, a creature you could commune with though she sleeps if she were awake we would all fall from her surface but uh, there are some priests of that plan that believe that the Apsu is hearing the voice of the, the earth, which is interesting. I don't know how to make that brew myself. I'm only of the first circle. Erishtum understands some of the theory better, but it sounds like it sounds like Apsu, but different somehow. Fascinating. It would be devastating if I've seen what happened when a smaller elemental stood up. I can't imagine if the entire world did. Erishtum says, uh, uh, he says, um, ah, you mean what happened with the city of brass? We heard yes. traders, traders some months after it happened came our way looking to sell and buy weapons. War profiteers, I think. Uh, they said something about the city and a terrible god. I, I can't imagine. The loss of life must be immense. I, I'm sorry to hear this. For your people, Ramus. It was a shame. But there was another threat there that was bigger. I won't go into it now, but... He was risen for a reason to wipe out a greater enemy. We understand this. Sometimes sacrifice must be made. Are you able to find your way back to where your home if you needed to? We have no home now, Ramus Krill. <laughs> Sorry, I used the wrong word. The place you came from. No, the veil has been drawn. We're outside of it now. The brands see to it. Oh. Well, I was wondering if there were others in in the Dwarven uh, hold that were unhappy with how things were going with the leadership. You're trying to build something. 
among your people, a new thinking. This is hard, harder still among dwarves. For every stubborn human, the power of ten within a dwarf, our minds are hard to change. It takes miracles of some significance. And they kind of both look at each other and Adikura looks, smiles at you like, miracles like bringing my dead husband back to life. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, um, it will take them seasons, years maybe, to find a new lawkeeper. Uh, I think Manu Mekbal will be closed for some time, which is as they like it. The veil is drawn for a reason. Hmm. I was wondering, do either of you have knowledge of the contents of other dwarven settlements around you? Like, would you know what was stored in, let's just say, and I named the, the, the dwarven name of the place that the people... I don't, I don't think you in. know it yet. I don't think anyone's Earth. ever said it. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, you say that. Like, do you know about any other, like, you know, dwarven holds around here? Um, Erish Tomb says, uh, there's, there's a lost hold, uh, a fortress supposedly uh, home to the great fortune of a, an elder queen of our kind, um, Asur Ekningal, but it's, it's lost, gone. Many don't even believe that it ever existed. I can't imagine the lawkeeper wouldn't have asked you about that. It was an obsession of his, finding that place. Hmm. Any idea why he was so obsessed with there's something there? So they look at each other like, mm, I don't know. And then we, we pan over and this is the first time Aga has said anything. So Aga is sitting there and he's, he's eating something with a, a spoon. He's got some stew or something. He's like slurping up this stew and he like wipes some out of his beard and he looks over and I envision Aga is kind of looking like Hagrid, but tiny. <laughs> um, and so he, he looks over and he, he gives you this kind of like wide eyes and he says, um, Aser Ek Ningal is real. I seen it. Tell me, man. What is it? <laughs> what have you and seen? He nods. Yeah, and he nods and he says, uh, I seen it with my own eyes. I was a wayfinder for a time before I became a warden. You see, and one night, we were up in the high mountains, and one of my men said he saw something, a light. And so we investigated, and when I went to look, I saw there a cage of iron holding something made of flame and two great stone doors marked with all the names of the queen that dwelt within. But before we could investigate, there came a great fear over me and my men. A sense of true, deep terror. The kind you only feel in the face of a great worm. And he nods, you can see him like... He says, we all felt the sting of that worm's flame that night, I tell you. The creature never showed its face, but we could feel it. Stalking us. Ah, it's one of my greatest regrets. I could never find my way back to that place. Ah, I dream it of the treasure within. But when I came back, I, I had to give up my, my job as a wayfinder because otherwise I would have come back. I would have found my way back to it. And that dragon, I am sure he would have come for me, eaten me up whole. So I took a job with the wardens. But still, that dream, every God's damn night. Dragon, that fear. You you felt a worm? Why a worm? And he, he seems like uh, such a n not menacing creature. And he, he says, uh, not a worm like what digs in the ground, human. <laughs> no, like one that tears through the sky and breathes flame or speaks to the voice of the storm. Uh, a great uh -oh. scaled thing, uh, uh, curled and gnarled and dangerous. Uh, you, the common word for it is dragon, but I know uh, they all take after their mother. 
black thing that slumbers wrapped around the world's heart. Nasty creatures. Terrible one, each and every one of them. Was it a worm of flame? Did you see fire? Yeah. And he, yeah, he nods uh, and he says, uh, Aye, and suitable too. Queen Elahe, her vault, they say it was buried under a, a mountain that spits fire, a volcano of old. It could have been nothing else. He nods. I, I know why these two are outcasts, but why were you, Sir Dwarf? <laughs> he shakes his head and he says, I had but one job. To guard the hold against those who would mean it harm. I was a warden. It was my job to, well, to protect, and I failed. At least in the eyes of the triumvirate, I did. What with having lost one of their members. <laughs> so in a way, your crimes, accidental or otherwise, it's been explained to me by your spiritual friend. <laughs> I was responsible as well. I bear my exile with shame. Even if there weren't nothing I could do about it. Did you leave behind family? He shakes his head. Never had much use for family myself. Bit of a loner. Aye, there's been romances here and there. Men and women from here to the ocean side I've lain in bed with. Sometimes... Two or three a time. But no, no love for old Aga. I'm a solitary creature. A lone wolf. I wander these lands by myself. For none understand me as well as the mountain herself does. And behind him, Adikur and Erish Tomb are just like, God, oh, this fucking guy. They're just rolling their eyes like, uh, why couldn't we have get, gotten exiled with somebody else? Uh, but yeah, he nods and he goes back to like, <laughs> Slurp in his soup. Mm. Well, one day we will have to find it, figure out how to get back to you, where you came from. We're not done with the dwarves yet. We will need them. But for now, you need to rest. And I would like help you uh, point to the one that's a cleric to hone your two skills. Of them are. Yeah. <laughs> I want to hone your skills as a cleric. Teach you some things. Help you become better. You have a have a knack for it and I think with time you both could be better. And they, they look at each other and Erish Tomb so Adikur says quietly to Erish Tomb, uh, she, she says, how does he know? And Erish Tomb is like, quiet. And then you finish and he says, um, when we first left Manu Mekbal, we were injured, as you saw, uh, exhausted, fatigued. Maharib was wounded from battle and you look over and like the big giant is sitting there just like staring at a rock, kind of like making a face like she's trying to make the rock move with her brain. We we were all injured. The, the road ahead was uncertain and we we prayed for healing, but nothing happened. The exile or <sighs> something has gone wrong and Prayers go unanswered. It may be that we are cursed, unable to wield that sort of magic anymore. Mm. They once told me that I would never have the skill to cast spells. I was terrible as, as a child. It wasn't until my <laughs> late teens I could finally cast my first cantrip. I know what it's like to struggle. Someone spent every day with me away from the others. 
and taught me in a way that I think I could work with you as well. You might have to start from from scratch, but I can help you find your gift again. It's there. It just may take some time for you to find it again. Erish Tomb nods, and, and I, I assume you're having this conversation in Dwarven. Uh, he says, and this is like a Dwarven parable loosely translated into English, but he says, Dwarves are born as clay, but die as iron, meaning both you're weak when you're small and you're strong at the end, right? That you get stronger as you age. But it also means that if you don't master something early, you will never master it because you will you'll harden before you can take shape. Uh, there are uh, there are like certain uh, dwarves. There's like a dwarven um, like social convention where if a dwarf hasn't chosen their profession and like figured out their life by a certain age, uh, they get put into like a shunned cast that's like clay. You're clay forever. Uh, so he, they've un- been unable to be fired. And so he says that he says, but we were born clay and die iron. Teaching us is our minds are stubborn. A, a priest came once before the veil was drawn and tried to teach some of us their prayers, a different way of magic. It didn't really hold. Some of the Claiborne went with him, but we, but now perhaps, perhaps you could teach us. Your prayers are different from theirs. You you worship none of the arcana. Your miracles come from elsewhere. Maybe, maybe we could learn them. We are willing to try. We've spoken of it. And Adikur nods to Erish Tomb like, yeah, yeah, like we're in. I, I feel the power in your heart that you want this. It may be hard and we will work together. But I think with time, we can get you to be in touch with the fountain again. They will tell you they will take away your ability to embrace her fountains, but to lie. We all can find a way back to it. So when you when you say that, they look at each other and, and Adikur Adikur says, um, uh, what what is this the fountain? We mm. we have no we have no name for that. What she looks at you like, what are you talking about? Like, the, our, your source of power is a fountain? It, where do they say your power comes from as a cleric, a dwarven cleric? From where do you draw power? From the veins. The world, and, and I'm, I'm sorry, Ramus, this is a child story, but the, the world is made like a rock of stratum. There is bright stone above and dark stone below and throughout veins of mineral um, power uh, that can be tapped, draw, drawn upon. These lines can be bright or dark, hot or cold. The magic we call upon is drawing on these veins. I want you to recite the incantations for me of a simple spell of yours. Just the words, even if they do nothing. I just want to study the words you're using. They both make like deeply uncomfortable faces and then Erishtum like nods like, I'll, I'll do this. Uh, and he, uh, he says, um, the words are not forbidden to me, even if the effects of them are. And he, he folds his hands and he, he starts to like murmur quietly uh, a, a prayer. Um, and uh, while he does, do you want to make like a religion check? Is that you're, you're analyzing the, yeah. the prayer as he casts I'm analyzing it? like what words and tones they're using. Like if it sounds more like something of the fountain or of the, the void, like where their magic yep. word incantations are coming from. And I crit. Hot damn. Yeah, yeah. So... Their their prayers uh, invoke uh, their so the repeating the repeating stuff in this is um, is threes they they repeat things in three the prayer he repeats three times each phrase of the prayer is repeated three times uh, he refers to um, the world above the world below and the world within 
uh, as the three realms, and he calls on uh, the um, the spirits of the spirits of the three worlds to open uh, open a vein and to deliver its bounty of magic. Right. Um, so the impression that you get here is that the dwarves are calling on something that is between, like they their prayers recognize both the power of the fountain and this alternate thing, this dark vein as well. Like it recognizes it in the prayer that there is an equal and opposite force on either side of the world in which you uh, you occupy. Uh, and that the spells call varyingly upon certain like mineral elements of uh, of those uh, of those worlds in connection with one another. So, yeah, in a way, it's both acknowledging that the void is a thing and that power exists, but it's also acknowledging that there is some kind of analog for heaven. Right. So it's all very familiar and eerily like notab notable to you. Yeah. You recognize yeah. like a lot of this stuff as being reflective of, of an experience that, you know, and yeah, the dwarves are so, already kind of like closer to harmony than, than you might expect. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm like getting like a feeling that their magic is like a merging of both the void and the fountain, some sort of byproduct of combining the two powers yeah, and there's a little bit of primordial, there's a little bit of like primordial stuff in there in the sense that it was probably adapted from an old worship of like an earth god. Uh, and so a lot of the structure feels kind of primordial and there's still a bit of that animism. There's, the prayers refer to specific uh, like names, like there are like hero figures or avatars or something like that. So it's a complicated mash of a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Uh, as he's praying, I... I try to, I'm asking him to inject a different word here and there uh, to try mm -hmm. to try to correct with his line of thought to like make it push more towards the fountain than the void. Cause he's, cause I think he's too far from the vo source that, that you like in the ground, like they're probably closer to the vein where they can pull from the void. So I'm guessing mm -hmm. up here they need to correct their spells to be focused more towards the fountain to get the same effects. So I'm trying to like correct words here and there as he's um, saying them to okay. try to get them to bend correctly. Make a, uh, make one more religion check. This is a uh, instructive. So you're going to try to like help, you know, change, change his magic. Um, but yeah, make a, make a religion roll. I would like to use my lucky on this. Okay, sure. <laughs> 14. <laughs> Oof. It's 14 still not good. So here's mm -hmm. what happens. And it's all probably a little bit surprising. So he's, he's like praying and you're like, try this. And like, he changes the prayer or whatever. Uh, you hear the sound of a gong from nowhere. You hear this brassy, like sound. And he stops and looks at you like, was that supposed to happen? It definitely wasn't. Um, and then you hear, uh, or I guess you see there's a bright light uh, that appears right in front of you in between this. So the two of you are sitting here and it's right in front of you. A bright point of light appears and it drops from the sky down to the floor and leaves a line, just a floating line of, of white light. And as you watch, it opens into the shape of a, a square door. Uh, and it's just a door standing there made out of glowing light. Uh, the door opens uh, and from it, you see a, uh, a strange long limbed uh, creature. He's uh, kind of see-through and has like a golden kind of glow to him. He's wearing a beautiful uh, bureaucrat's robe and holding uh, a scroll uh, under one arm. He has a big tall hat uh, that reminds you of the courtiers of the Court of Coins. Um, and he has these big featureless white eyes. Uh, and he just steps out of the door and then closes it behind him. And he looks at the, the group of you. And he looks at, uh, at Ramus. And he looks at uh, at the at the dwarf heir's tomb, and he says, uh, he says, he says, one moment, please. And he's speaking, he's speaking exactly the same way Maharib was. So you hear common, and uh, heir's tomb hears dwarven, and even the giantess looks over, like, what the hell? Who's this guy? And uh, and so he says, he unfurls the scroll, and he looks at it, and he says, Ramus Krill, heir's tomb. Am I correct? And he tucks it back under his arm. Who are you? And he sighs, who I am matters less than why I am here. I am from the Bureau of Unauthorized Religious Practice, and I need to give both of you a citation. And he reads into his, reads into his robes, and he pulls out two uh, folded, two envelopes, two black envelopes. 
and he hands the he puts them out in one in each hand. He hands them to to the two of you. Erish Doom goes to reach for his unless you stop him. I stop him. Yeah. And okay. what is our violation for? <sighs> and he turns and he opens it and he looks at the scroll and he says it says here you are guilty of Ah, blasphemy. Excellent. Very nice. That's how you get Mara, you know. Several counts of blasphemy, uh, several counts of conspiracy to create an illegal religion. Uh, I have uh, uh, gathering uh, gathering uh, acolytes without official permission. Very nice. There's quite a lot of crimes here, Mr. Krill. Would you like me to continue? I would like to argue that according to the laws of freedom of expression of the arcana we are in fact we're guiding this soul to the fountain which is the goal of the heaven in is the goal of heaven he was praying to the wrong sources and we were correcting him to pray towards the fountain instead i would argue that your citation is incorrect and unnecessary and i will file an appeal he he nods uh, he sighs and he takes both the envelopes back and he tucks them in his bag and he says, very well, are you versed in the prayer of divine appeals? If you are not versed in the prayer of divine appeals, a priest will be assigned to you to perform said prayer in your honor. <sighs> Would you like to be assigned a priest? Yes, and I need one that is of the appropriate height, the right hair color, or I will feel oppressed. So please find the exact priest that fits this description. I'm going to write a really long description. Yeah, yeah. it is so my you, right. You start. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he, he nod, he's nodding and he's like, uh, you're invoking the, invoking the right of simulacra. Fine. Fine. It looks like, and he looks at the, he looks at the sheet and, uh, and kind of goes over it. And he says, uh, it looks like the next available appointment is going to be in. 286 years and he reaches into his uh, into his robes and he hands you uh, he hands you another envelope. This one is white. Uh, he holds it out and he says, you need to bring this to the capital of the court of coins. Should it yet remain standing in 286 years so that you might come before the court and be given your chance to speak your case. In the meantime, you are hereby instructed to refrain from any acts of blasphemy, religion building, spiritualism. You may continue if you are ordained as a priest to continue your priestly duties, but until such time as you are able to have your case seen before court in 200, oh, 326 years. I'm sorry, it looks like your appointment was taken before you were able to just take the damn envelope. Thank you, sir. I will see you he, in court. And he nods and he says, very well, I'll see you in 300 odd years. And he turns and he looks at the dwarf. And he says, stay away from unsanctioned religions. God, it's like you don't even care about your souls. And he turns around, he walks through the door, and the door closes and disappears. And Aristoon looks up at you like, what the hell was that? It was one of heaven's greatest weaknesses, bureaucracy. He, and he nods as if, like, I understand, but inside is shaking his head like, I don't understand. <laughs> and I think maybe I think maybe that's the I think that's the moment, right? I think that's where we, we kind of fade on the two of you talking about this, this religion and your your official citation uh, to uh, to come before the court uh, for creating a fake religion, uh, at least in the eyes of heaven. So. Nice. All right. Cool. Yeah. Uh, let's do some shout. What a weird way to end the episode. Let's do some shout outs, <laughs> right? And uh, we'll do some goals and get some XP. Uh, Zeke, mm -hmm. why don't you start us off and let us know when we're gonna go and fight that boss? Maybe because some of us have been waiting for two days, Zeke. <laughs> I don't know, maybe. All right, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. I almost said welcome. Thank you for tuning in every week. My name is Ezekiel the Third. You can find me at or slash Ezekiel underscore I I on Twitch, Twitter, and YouTube. Follow me. Follow me in those places. Uh, thank you to Max, Dan, JP, and Adam for making this highlight of my week every week. I absolutely love it. Um, if you want to catch me, I'll be on Drop Frames tomorrow, 
And then after that, I will not be broadcasting because I have another another meeting for ah! a for a for a DN, for a role playing <laughs> side piece. You know, you know, you got to have that side piece. <laughs> like the, the Court of Swords is my main my main gal, but like my side piece is get out of here. It's pretty good too. Um, <laughs> but I will be continuing my Persona Four Golden Run on Thursday at noon Pacific. And yes, first order of business will be fighting a boss. Maybe, nice. maybe if, if I don't need to grind some more, I might need to grind some Thir- more. Thursday, that's when it's happening. <laughs> Thursday, that's okay. that's it, baby. Okay. I'll give you that right. fix on Thursday, baby. Okay. I'm getting the new shit. Don't yeah. feel, Zeke, don't don't feel bad about having another RPG on the side. I've got four. Boom. <laughs> it's true. Shit. I'm an amateur man. <laughs> I'm, I'm a very busy dungeon master. Let me you just ever say. seen what is that American Pimp? That documentary? Mm-hmm. <laughs> I have not, like, but it sounds great. <laughs> it's like this this one like legendary pimp came to town. He had ten hoes taken from him by other pimps, and they're like, "Oh shit, you got played." He's like, "Man, you think that's all the horses I got in my stable?" <laughs> that's Adam. Christ. Like he's got a lot of horses in his stable. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Dan, do some shoutouts for us. I am Dan's Gaming, a uh, variety streamer on Twitch. Uh, currently doing a Dragon Age uh, playthrough of all the all three games. Um, finishing up the Awakening expansion pack before I do two. Ugh, I hate two. Um, but <laughs> having super fun with it, regardless. Uh, another super fun episode today. Had a lot of fun playing with bureaucracy and trying to start a religion. Um, <laughs> a lot of fun, and I can't wait to do it again next week. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome stuff. Can't wait till then either. Max, tell the people when you're playing God of War. I'm not playing God of War. All right. I wore uh, the shirt. Adam, do some shout outs for it. I wore the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> he, gets his, he gets the shout outs for the shirt. Go ahead, Max. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thanks, guys, for watching. Um, I'm. <laughs> Haha, the lawyer, the, the heavenly lawyer came down and <laughs> yelled at you. That was funny. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so much for watching. Um, I don't know uh, if you want to follow me on anything, but if you can, it's there. It's up to you. Go for it. I wore the shirt, um, and we'll talk about the episode afterwards. And I don't know if I'm going to be live later on, but if I am, you can keep an eye on Twitter, uh, which is all right there um, if you want to. Cool. That's all I got. Adam, some shout outs. That's me. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody. You can find me on Twitter at Skinny Ghost or twitch.tv slash Adam Coble. Uh, you can start right now by going to community.itmejp.com and checking out that Q&A thread. I just threw up there. They're always really fun. People throwing around theories, asking me questions. Some of them I can answer. Um, so go and check that out. And uh, as I mentioned, I've got lots of other RPGs going on all the time. Uh, I do two shows over at twitch.tv slash D&D. Two right here and one on my own channel. So lots of that content every week. So check it out. Go have a look. <coughs> cool. Who wants cool. experience points? Does anybody want experience? Should we, should we do that? Yeah, do it. Uh, I think it's a lot of working on today because this is one of those episodes, but let's let's yeah, take a look. So Ramus, uh, let's see. Uh, you worked on evacuating the embers for sure. Uh, and I think you worked on experimenting, uh, with void magic, but I think, I think for, for it to actually count, they'll have to be some kind of like ritual with some danger, but talking to the dwarves about it definitely worked you in that direction. Yeah. So working on those two. Okay. Okay. And that's how much do you get for, uh, uh, worked on a hundred now? Yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, Berg, you worked on replacing the hammer and worked on evacuating the cultists. So that's another 800 for you as well. And then Bird? 10 pillars. Right. What's that? Is it 800 per? Uh, yeah, it's eight, yeah, it's 800 right. now, 600. right? 600, okay. Um, yes, you yeah, 800. You said 800 and it sounded yeah, like Yeah, sorry, yeah, 800 each. Clarifying. And you did two of them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so 10, 10 pillars. Of, you worked on... Finding out more about the void weapons, right? Um, and uh, worked on convincing the uh, the embers to take action. I think you'll probably resolve that one next time. I feel like the next time is going to be the like, let's get everything together and get the hell out of here. Um, and then uh, Maharib, uh, I have your goals. I, I grabbed them off your character sheet, but do you okay. want to read them out and, and we'll we'll check in on them? Sure. Uh, they are help Ramus not make the same mistakes. Heaven did while growing harmony. Uh, explore the tiefling genealogy within myself and help Berg find a weapon worthy of himself. Nice. Okay. 
Um, Thanks, so bud. we think we yeah, no think problem. we worked on these ones. I think the uh, the Berg the conversation you had with Berg is definitely worth a, a working. I on. think one and two, or sorry, one and three, definitely not not two. <clears throat> I yes, challenged yeah, I agree. Outside, so that was the goal with that at least. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. I really like so so folks who are interested in watching character development and watching how a character changes over time. Keep an eye on the goals that that JP writes for Maharib and watch how they're different from Maharib before, right? In phrasing and in intent, because I think that's a really good way to get an idea of, of JP's idea of the character. Yep. Uh, I'm certainly going to be paying close attention to him. So. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and you said that was 800 mm-hmm. each, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. For level 16. Cool. All right. That'll do it. That's it. We're out. Killer. We're going to go do that post show. Patreon.com slash roleplay. If you want to watch that, it should be up in about 45 minutes from this posting. Unless you're watching on YouTube, then it is already up. Uh, we'll see you guys tomorrow for Drop Frames or next week for more Court of Swords Tuesday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Yeah. We're out. Everyone do your cool wave that we learned in the beginning. Woo! We're cool. Oh, God, Woo! We're cool wave. We're idiots. Get out Wavy of here. Wave we are. Bye!